In this video, we will conceptually introduce sample variance curve fitting. We will become familiar with plots of curves fitted to data with error bars, familiar with the definition of chi-squared, and familiar with the idea that chi-squared minimized during curve fitting often turns out to have a value in the neighborhood of the number of plotted points minus the number of fitting parameters. The final methods and expressions we will present take into account realistic situations in which our theoretical knowledge of the experimental system is limited. To develop our discussion, however, we first suppose that we have a model of the world that we regard as accurate. This is a relationship between variable y and variable x. When making measurements at x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5, we anticipate obtaining the vertical positions along the y-axis represented by the orange markers. We refine our model by acknowledging the presence of noise. For example, when working in a physics lab, we might reason that fluctuations in our measurements reflect a large number of small fluctuations from a variety of instrumental sources. And borrowing notions from the video tutorials on the central limit theorem, we would expect measurements to fall in Gaussian distributions centered on the so-called perfect yellow curve. One experiment might yield these five blue triangles. Repeating the experiment might then yield these five yellow stars, and another repetition might provide these five red squares. In this example, the triangles, stars, and squares do not coincide. Additionally, none of the experimental datasets precisely coincides with the so-called perfect positions of the orange markers. Consider the particular experiment which yielded these five yellow stars. The red arrow indicates the vertical distance by which the y value of the fifth star is displaced above its corresponding ideal orange marker. Denote this vertical displacement delta y5 star, where the parenthetic reference to star reminds us that this deviation is obtained particularly using the dataset star. In a similar fashion, we can identify vertical displacements between the other four yellow stars and their corresponding ideal orange markers. At a rough order of magnitude level, we anticipate that these deviations will often be similar in size to the standard deviations, those sigmas of the Gaussian distributions, from which the stars were drawn. What is the probability distribution function describing the likelihood of getting a first vertical displacement, delta y1 star, a second vertical displacement, delta y2 star, and so forth, all in the one same experiment? In some situations, it is reasonable to say that the fluctuations of different individual measurements from their ideal values are statistically independent. In these special situations, the probability distribution factorizes into a first part, p1 on delta y1 star, that depends only on the vertical displacement of the first star, a second part, p2 on delta y2 star, that depends only on the vertical displacement of the second star, and so forth. For readers following along with pencil and paper, please note that we are playing fast and loose by talking about probabilities when we are working with probability distributions associated with continuous variables, meaning probability distributions that are to be used in the context of integrals. Substituting Gaussian distributions into each of these probability distribution factors, and then combining the terms in their individual exponents into a sum, as we are allowed to do when exponents are multiplied together, we obtain a probability distribution in which the standard deviations, those sigmas, of the individual Gaussians appear in a denominator out front, and in which ratios of squared deviations to variances appear together in the exponent in a sum. This sum constitutes the guts of the probability distribution, and we give it a special name, chi-squared. Chi-squared is a sum over normalized squared deviations. In the first term, the vertical deviation delta y1 star is squared and then normalized by dividing by the variance sigma 1 squared of the corresponding first Gaussian distribution plotted at x1. The remaining terms in the sum are constructed analogously. Chi-squared is a way to express how far away the stars as a collection of measurements are from the theoretical curve. The bigger the disagreement between the collection of stars and the model curve, the greater the chi-squared value. A negative sign appears alongside chi-squared in the exponential function in the probability distribution. Thus, the bigger the chi-squared value, the lower the probability p of getting such a set of stars from the given theory. In this example, we have written chi-squared as chi-squared star to make it explicit that it is calculated using the data set of stars. Other values of chi-squared might result from instead using the data set of triangles, or instead using the data set of squares, or instead using any of a variety of other data sets not explicitly illustrated. 
In other words, a value of chi-squared can be calculated each time the experiment that here yielded the stars is repeated. The average of chi-squared over a large number of experiments is the number of measurements m in each experiment. Here m equals 5 because we are obtaining stars at x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. The viewer may pause the video to verify this equation by recognizing that each of the squared deviations in the equation for chi-squared turns into a variance upon averaging. We just discussed statistical aspects of the displacements of a particular set of measurements, those stars, from a model that was clearly specified and assuredly accurate. We knew exactly what yellow curve we were investigating. It was drawn without ambiguity. We now extend this discussion to a situation more relevant for research, in which the theoretical model to be compared to experimental data is not itself fully specified. By pursuing this line of analysis, we will develop a procedure for reporting and assessing the quality of curve fits to data. Often, in real life, we lack exact knowledge of the correct model and of the widths of the distributions from which experimental measurements are drawn. In contrast to the thumbnail at the top left, the big plot to the right contains only sample means and associated error bars. The plot includes neither a model curve nor Gaussian distributions. We appear to lack ingredients that we previously used to write down a probability distribution function describing the likelihood of getting an observed data set from a given theory. To address these two aspects of our ignorance, we make two assumptions. We play pretend in two ways. Suppose our theoretical knowledge amounts to an imprecise guess as to the shape of a curve relating y and x. In this example, we have reason to anticipate a sigmoidal curve, but we don't know the horizontal position x-half at which the curve is halfway between its minimum and maximum vertical y-values. Additionally, we don't know the minimum y-value of the curve, which we call the vertical offset y naught. Rather than having a single model drawn confidently as a single bold yellow curve, we have a collection of many possible models, five examples of which are illustrated. We make our first assumption by pretending that we know that one of these curves is correct and that we know which of these curves that is. For example, pick the curve now drawn boldly in gold. Our second assumption relates to the distributions from which our data are drawn. Pretend that the sample means were plucked from Gaussian distributions with standard deviations exactly equal to the plotted standard errors. Because we are pretending that the solid gold curve happens to be the correct model, the Gaussian distributions should be shifted so as to be centered on this curve. We are pretending that the solid gold curve is the correct model and that the standard errors represented by the error bars indicate the widths of Gaussian distributions. We are pretending that this collection of Gaussian distributions is the source from which our sample means were drawn. Playing pretend in these ways allows us to write down an approximate probability distribution for the vertical displacements of the stars from the solid gold curve, which might actually be different from the vertical displacements of the stars from an accurate model. And playing pretend in these ways also allows us to use the standard errors, which might be different from the standard deviations of the actual distributions from which the sample means were drawn. Even though we have pointed out slight differences between the sum of the normalized squared deviations that appears in this exponent and the sum of the normalized squared deviations that we saw earlier, we also label this object chi-squared. On this slide, we have discussed the calculation of a chi-squared value using the solid gold curve. The same calculation applied to other curves can provide possibly different additional values of chi-squared and thus possibly different additional values of the probability p of getting the observed data set of stars. Some curves may line up poorly with the stars. We may pretend that these curves are the correct model and anchor Gaussian distributions upon them. However, in each case, the observed data set looks as though it would only rarely arise from the given curve. In these examples, many of the deviations between data points and model curves are large in the sense that they are noticeably greater than the associated standard errors. For most of the data points, the I-beams, those error bars, fail to thread the chosen model curve. In other cases, curves may line up more closely with the stars. In such a case, the possibility that the chosen curve is correct and that the observed data came from the Gaussian distributions centered upon the curve, that possibility is more plausible. In this example, it happens that each I-beam threads the model curve. 
the curve we regard as our best answer is the one that most closely hugs the data in the sense of having the smallest sum of normalized squared deviations meaning minimum chi-squared the probability of obtaining the observed data set given hypothetically that a particular model curve is correct is related to the chi-squared through an exponential and a negative sign minimizing chi-squared thus corresponds to choosing the model for which the probability p of finding the observed data set would be greatest our best answer is a curve out of the many possible curves for which it looks most as though the data set of stars came so to speak from the curve adjust the parameters until you obtain the curve that makes it most look as though the data set came from your adjusted curve this is the curve corresponding to maximum probability in other words minimum chi-squared in this example x half star and y naught star are the parameters that specify the curve that minimizes chi-square for the particular data set of stars Different values of x half could arise when performing fitting, for example, to the set of triangles or to the set of squares. To characterize the variation among values of x half that can be obtained from a large collection of experiments, we describe a procedure that boils down to the quadrature formula of uncertainty propagation. Make the star at x1 jiggle a vertical distance equal to its standard error. The originally measured set of stars is modified by the disturbance of the height of the first star. By momentarily pretending that this modified data set is itself a data set to be fit, we can calculate another best fit value of the parameter x half, which potentially differs from the best fit value of x half originally obtained by using the undisturbed set of stars. We can calculate a difference between these parameter values. We can calculate other examples of differences between the best fit values of x half and the undisturbed value of x half by individually jiggling the other stars one by one by their respective standard errors. Squaring before adding these differences provides a sample estimate s sub x half star of the standard deviation of the distribution from which the best fit parameter x half star was plucked. A sample estimate of the standard deviation for y naught is calculated in an analogous way. The equation at the top is an example of the quadrature formula of uncertainty propagation expressed explicitly in terms of differences rather than in terms of partial derivatives. We are calculating an uncertainty in the best fit value of x half that arises owing to uncertainty in the position of the first sample mean, that's the one at x1, owing to the uncertainty in the position of the second sample mean, that's the one at x2, and so forth. By comparing with the video tutorial on the quadrature formula, the viewer may notice that the entire process of obtaining a best fit value of x half by minimizing chi-square is being regarded here as a so-called function. This is an example of how the functions abstractly referred to in the video on the quadrature formula can be presented in forms other than one-line formulas. The quadrature formula can still be applied even in situations where functions appear in the form of oral instructions or, for example, computer programs. In addition to the minimized value of chi-squared obtained from the yellow stars, we can obtain potentially different minimized values of chi-squared by fitting to the set of squares or instead to the set of triangles. Over a large number of experiments, we would get a large number of minimized chi-squared values. What is their average? If the correct model, meaning the actual parent distribution from which the sample means were drawn, can be specified by adjusting the fitting parameters appropriately, then the average of the minimized chi-squared values equals the number of measurements m minus the number of fitting parameters n param. In this case, sample means were obtained at x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5, so the number of measurements plotted is m equals 5. The number of adjustable parameters is n param equals 2 because we have allowed both x half and y naught to be adjusted. How can we understand the presence of n param in this equation? In the slide where we previously calculated the average value of chi-square, we drew a single theoretical curve with confidence and without ambiguity. There were no fitting parameters. On this slide, however, we are not comparing data sets to a fully specified model known to be accurate. Instead, fitting parameters allow model curves to float toward the data against which they are to be compared. 
This gives the minimized chi-square value a tendency to be a little smaller than would be expected if the model were the so-called correct curve fixed in place by being specified fully. Thus, the average value of the minimized chi-square is reduced from the number of measurements, as it turns out without derivation here, by the number of fitting parameters. We denote the difference m minus n per m using the Greek letter nu. This is called the degrees of freedom. The ratio of the chi-squared value, minimized for a particular experiment, to the degrees of freedom is called the reduced chi-square, and at an order of magnitude level often lands in the neighborhood of unity. Based on the discussion we have developed throughout this video, we provide a procedure for sample variance curve fitting. Measure individual samples so as to construct sample means and standard errors at a variety of values of x. Present and justify a fitting function and fitting parameters. Ideally, this is done before the experiment. Adjust fitting parameters until the curve hugs the dataset as closely as possible, meaning that chi-square is minimized for your dataset. This means considering different model curves corresponding to different parameter values and regarding as your best answer the curve for which it most looks as though the observed data came from the model curve. The development and assessment of algorithms that aim to find parameter values that minimize chi-squared is an active area of research. The best fit curve and parameters may vary from experiment to experiment. Jiggle the data points individually each by their standard error to calculate sample estimates of the standard deviations of the distributions from which the best fit parameter values were drawn. The fitting parameters we have calculated are our best estimates given our set of data and our model. How do we know that our best is any good? The following steps provide quality control. The ratio of the minimized chi-squared value to the degrees of freedom, meaning the reduced chi-squared, is expected to land roughly in the neighborhood of unity. Check whether this is actually the case. Chi-squared distribution tables can be used when it is desired to report a numerical probability value for exceeding a particular value of reduced chi-squared. Finally, plot normalized residuals to determine whether the vertical deviations between the stars and the fitted curve exhibit systematic behavior. A plot of the vertical deviations, those delta y stars, each divided by its corresponding standard error, is called a plot of normalized residuals. Ideally, these bars fluctuate above and below zero without any discernible pattern, and with a characteristic order of magnitude of 1. If a set of data passes quality control, meaning steps 3 and 4, you may report with some confidence the minimized chi-squared value, the best fit parameter values, and the sample estimates of the standard deviations of the distributions from which the best fit parameter values were drawn. In this video, we have introduced plots of curves fitted to data with error bars, we have introduced the definition of chi-square, and we have introduced curve fitting based on minimizing chi-square or equivalently maximizing probability. The minimized chi-square value often lands in the neighborhood of the number of measurements minus the number of fitting parameters. The recipe we outlined on the previous slide uses uncertainties estimated from sample measurements to provide a curve fit. This procedure is sometimes referred to as sample variance curve fitting.